Saturday was not a good performance. Could it end up being a good thing for the Ducks in the long run? You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks, which is why if you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch the show, which today is brought to you by Ultimate College Football HC, a brand new mobile game that's completely free, has no ads, and is playable offline 100%. Use the promo code LOCKDOWNCFB, all caps, inside the game store to receive a free boost to your program begin your coaching legacy today three players that have to improve for oregon to beat boise state this week and is it an issue that there were players dancing to shout on saturday i'll address that and more from the mailbag coming up on today's show but i was thinking about this game and all the hype that oregon has coming into this season players and coaches can say and sometimes will say others will not uh, freely admit that or or state that they don't hear the hype, that they don't hear the noise, positive, negative, anywhere in between. They don't hear it. They hear it. There might be players. I know for a fact that there are parents of players that have listened to or watched this very show before. I don't know if that information gets relayed directly back to individual players, but the bottom line is that whether it's on this show or whether it's Josh Pate picking Oregon to go 11-1 and or Joel Klatt picking them to the playoff or the 24-7 guys picking them to go 12-0, and which obviously is reasonable because that's what I pick coming into the season as well, there's plenty of hype around this team. And so I was thinking about this, and then one of you asked a question, which I'll get to in a moment, about whether it could be a good thing. I'm not completely bought into that notion. I see where that line of thought can come from, But you shouldn't need a swift kick in the rear by almost having a historic upset at home week one against Idaho to make you motivated for the season. That shouldn't be the case. And based on what we've seen from Dan Lanning teams over the last couple of years, I don't think that is the case. It might end up being that way because Oregon played a horrible game on Saturday, closer than it ever should have been. And maybe now... Anyone that internalized, hey, we're really good, we're really capable, where you've gone from bordering on the line of belief to overconfidence, are those guys now going to go back to having a chip on their shoulder because guys are going to be doubted because the team has a negative narrative nationally around it right now. And you know what? Understandably so. They, they, They deserve that particular label. Can that be good? Sure. That, that could end up being a good thing. The more likely explanation to me, if Oregon turns this season around, is they overlooked their opponent, Idaho is better than we thought, and they just had a really, really bad game, and it was week one. Last year, Alabama, albeit in bad weather conditions, was in a dogfight with South Florida. South Florida. They went on to beat Georgia in the SEC championship game. Teams can progress. And you know what Alabama was trying to figure out last year? The quarterback situation. Oregon knows who its quarterback is. That's not in doubt. There's no Dante Moore talking. Like Dylan Gabriel's a starting quarterback. He should be. He's good. Not perfect, but was not the fundamental problem with Oregon's offense on Saturday. And there's only one thing for this Oregon team to clean up, and it's the offensive line. But to say that how you play in week one is how you're going to play in week 12 or week 13 or week 14 or God willing, week 15, 16, 17, or however many games Oregon ends up playing this season. If you had hopes, aspirations, goals, expectations for this team to perform at a certain level, we can all agree they did not play to that level on Saturday night. That doesn't mean they're never going to hit their ceiling. Because the well-founded and widely understood justification for teams or or for fans rather to look at this team and say they should have the biggest hype that they have had since the last time they went to the national championship game 10 years ago, those players haven't gone anywhere. The the playoff and Big Big Ten championship caliber team that's on paper is still in there. They just haven't put it on the field yet. 
and maybe they just need a couple weeks. There are a lot of transfers on this roster. Dylan Gabriel's one of them. Tez Johnson said he thought Gabriel was a little bit hesitant at times. Well, maybe he settles in a little bit more after week one. Maybe the offensive line, which had a late reshuffle because of the injury to Matthew Bedford and lost Jackson Powers Johnson at starting center, maybe those injuries or slash departures are more impactful than we originally thought. And there are going to be, until Bedford gets inserted back in there, cohesion issues up front along the offensive line. And maybe they needed a week to get the kinks out. And that coincided with Idaho playing a really, really good game and Oregon being sloppy. Because when I look at Oregon last year, they certainly played better football at the end of the season than they did at the start. They went into Texas Tech, and they almost lost the game. Very easily could have lost the game. The defense wasn't playing well. There were a bunch of penalties all over the place. By the time they played Oregon State last week, the regular season, beat the Beavs 31-7 to at Autzen Stadium, that team was a lot better than what Oregon put on the field in Week 2. So, I have not abandoned all hope because this is still an incredibly talented roster. And a lot of those newcomers and a lot of the reasons that Oregon fans are excited about this year, that I'm excited about this year, they're still on the team. It's not like there was a catastrophic injury to one or several position groups that now make it look like a completely different projected starting lineup than what you had coming into the year. So that's my opening rant for today. A question came from Beginner Catholic along those lines. YouTube comments X, formerly known as Twitter. If you want priority access, become a Locked On Ducks insider. Link in the description below wherever you listen to or watch this show. After having some extra time to think about it, I think the game yesterday was the best possible start to the season. Do not agree there. With all the hype, this team needed a dose of humility. They got that and were still able to escape with a W. They can take it and turn it into their advantage going forward. To some degree... This could be the case, but there should already be, if there isn't, a chip in that Oregon locker room, which is there is yet to be a football team for the University of Oregon that goes out and wins a national championship. And you're a newcomer in the Big Ten and people feel like you have something to prove. It could be an extra level of motivation for Oregon that that gives players urgency they didn't necessarily have before of a different type of hey, we need to make sure that we are worth everything that people have talked us up to be rather than just thinking that we are and saying that we are on paper. It shouldn't need to come to that. When you're trying to win the first national championship in the history of Oregon football, it shouldn't come to that. When you're going into the Big Ten for the first time, it shouldn't have to come to that. Maybe it does. Maybe it ends up working out. When Dan Lanning teams have struggled in the past, they've had good performances the following week. And God help my Twitter mentions and that of every other Oregon media person out there. If Oregon goes three and out on their first possession against Boise State, disaster will be ensuing. I'm more than a, I, I'm getting more intrigued by the day at what this Oregon team is going to do on Saturday. Vegas still likes them as a big favorite. Open is a 19 and a half point favorite. It's down to 18 and a half, probably because people are looking at Oregon and seeing shades of Florida State who lost as a double-digit favorite in week one and lost as an even bigger favorite in week two. Maybe Oregon is Florida State. Maybe they come out and, yeah, they escaped Idaho, but Boise State walks into Autzen and makes it four straight wins against the Broncos. I don't get the sense that that's going to be the case. Team can improve. Still a lot of things to like. The motivation level, sure. It, it could be there. It could be heightened slightly after the Idaho scare. It should have already been high enough to play better than that. And I think Dan Lanning's going to be able to push the right buttons. Let me know your thoughts in YouTube comments or hit me up on X, formerly known as Twitter at S McLaughlin CFB or at Locked on Ducks. Those are the handles. A couple guys have to be better for Oregon to beat Boise State and to do so comfortably and regain the status that they had coming into the year as a national title contender. Who are those guys? That's coming up next. Hey, Locked On Ducks fans, want to take a moment to give you a heads up about a brand new mobile game I think you're going to love, Ultimate College Football HC. In this amazing game and simulation, you get to step into the shoes of a head coach and lead your college football program to glory. You can actually be the head coach of the Ducks. You recruit players, you hire coaching staff, you oversee training camps, you manage scholarships, plus 
play calling. Yeah, that's right. It's all in your hands. The future and the legacy of your program is in your hands. Ultimate College Football HC, it's completely free, has no ads, 100% playable offline. You can play on the go as you want and when you want to. And of course, we have a special offer for Locked On Ducks fans. Use the promo code Locked On CFB, all caps, inside the game store to receive a free boost to your program. Make sure to take advantage of this perk as it will get your team off to a strong start. And it's a program game to be sure. To download the game, just visit ultimate cfb.com or look it up on the app stores ultimate college football hc begin your coaching legacy today nobody's perfect in week one few guys play the best they possibly can in week one unless your name is brandon johnson or a couple of the defensive linemen there are guys that have to improve i'm going to give you three names here three names that for oregon to beat Boise State and cover that 18.5-point spread, win by 20-plus points against the preseason Mountain West favorites and one of the G5 playoff contenders as well. If they're going to accomplish that, these three guys have to be better. Number one, Johnny Cornelius. Figure out where the line of scrimmage is. I think that's an easy fix. Let's not forget that one of those, I forget when the second one was specifically, but one of those derailed a chunk play on a drive that ended up leading to no points. If that penalty doesn't happen, again, small thing, little thing, easy to correct. Does Oregon wind up getting points on that drive? Does the game have a completely different feel? Yes, it could. Should the margin be that thin between a blowout and a close game against Idaho? Nope, it should not. Was it on that day? Apparently so. But a Johnny Cornelius allowed the strip sack of Dylan Gabriel in the first half. The offensive line's pass protection altogether has to be better, but he had the two penalties not one but two penalties in the first half in which he wasn't on the line of scrimmage and then he got beat for the strip sack but johnny cornelius is by nfl draft scout accounts going to be selected don't know about a first round guy but certainly an early to mid round projection in the nfl next year he is that sort of talent he has been good to great since the moment he stepped onto the field for the Ducks last year. Came over from Rhode Island and boom, made immediate impact. He's a veteran guy. He spent two years at Rhode Island. This is his second year with Oregon. Same offensive line coach, same offensive coordinator, just a new quarterback. Now there was a different center. I'm not going to discount anymore how big of a change that can be for an offensive line. Different guy calling the signals, making sure everybody's on the same page. They clearly weren't. They were not at their sharpest, and Cornelius was at the center of that. But given his track record and the number of good games he has put on film, yeah, I expect him to bounce back in a pretty significant way. And number two is the guy that is slotted right next to him to his left, Iapani Lalaulu or Poncho, who was a breakout performer as a true freshman last year, did not expect a true freshman offensive lineman to play, but he did, was playing essentially a starter's number of snaps, Didn't have questions about him coming into the year. He had a bad game. He had a bad game. He got beat for a sack. He had a holding penalty. I don't know if it was actually correctly attributed to to Poncho or if it should have been on someone else. But when you go back and watch the lack of success of running plays, he was not moving guys around the way he's capable of. On the fourth and inches that Oregon went for it on their own side of the field, which I had no problem with, by the way, whatsoever, get a yard against Idaho. That you, you you should be able to get it get it you should be able to get a yard against Idaho. If you're going up against Ohio State, that's a different question. But against Idaho, man, fourth and a yard or less, you should be able to pick that up no problem. Poncho was a pulling guard. The it was a power play to the left. They had um, they had a fullback in there, and uh, Kawika Rogers whiffed on a block, and and then the fullback ran into him, and then. Poncho comes around, trips on the turf. I mean, it it was the bad news bears in a football play. Do I think that's going to continue? Do do I think you're going to have guys like that play, that concept, that pin and pull that Oregon's done in the the I formation over the last couple of years, it looked a little bit different in that particular play. Do I think guys are going to literally run into each other and trip over their own feet every single week? I'm going to go with no. But does Poncho have to be better? Yeah. Yeah, most of the pressures that Dylan Gabriel 
had had to deal with were coming from the right side of that offensive line. Not all of them, by the way. Josh Connerly allowed one, and it negated what might have been a touchdown. Sadiq was open in the back corner of the end zone, but Gabriel had to step up. It was on the play that ended up being called for a hold, and then Oregon, you know, had to had to settle for a field goal eventually. Kenny Sadiq was wide open, but Gabriel didn't get a chance to see him because Connerly got beat right off the ball. So certainly, no one was perfect throughout the entire course of the game. But the right side of the offensive line. Johnny Cornelius, Iapani Lalaulu. If Matthew Bedford is not back against Boise State this weekend, those guys are going to have to be better. And then the third guy I've got here is someone I talked about on yesterday's show, Dylan Gabriel. I thought Dylan Gabriel was good. He tied an Oregon record for completed passes in a game with 41. 41. He was 41 of 49, 380 yards, two touchdowns. It's not bad. It's not bad. But whether it's making the right reads a willingness to look downfield, accuracy down the field, or trusting your offensive line to give you time, which I I understand if he didn't have the utmost trust in the offensive line because they allowed far too many quarterback pressures in that game. Gabriel has to be able to to complete some passes down the field and create explosive plays for the offense. Just has to happen. It doesn't have to look like last year's Washington or 2019 LSU. It doesn't have to be that consistent. It just has to be present. It has to be a threat. You, you have to be able to bring to the table what Bo Nix and Troy Franklin did last year. And if Evan Stewart is your downfield guy, or if it's Treshawn Holden, or if it's Kyler Casper, doesn't matter. You have to find explosive plays in the passing game and get you some chunk yardage or get some easy touchdowns. That was lacking. Everything else Gabriel did on the short stuff and intermediate stuff, he was really good. He was really good. Didn't make a lot of dangerous throws. I think he only had one or two that that could have been picked off by a defender. He was accurate. He was throwing a tight spiral. Didn't look like that hand injury he suffered early in the game was bothering him at all. But certainly, that's the other aspect. And if Dylan Gabriel is the number three, this is, again, a silver lining optimism point for Oregon fans out there. If Dylan Gabriel is the third guy I come up with, with to which I have to say he's got to be better, that's a good place to be because everyone else performed exactly how I spe- expected them to. I thought both running backs looked great. There was some chatter in the YouTube comments about don't give it to Whittington, go with Jordan James. Newsflash, neither one of them can go anywhere if there are no holes along the offensive line. Noah Whittington looked healthy. Noah Whittington looked agile, and he just didn't really have anywhere to go. Both guys, whatever, give, give them the run. Like I, I think both are tremendous running backs. No qualms. Wide receivers looked great. Tight ends, awesome. Defensive line, fantastic. Linebackers would like to see him be a little bit healthier and see more Jeff Boss and Justin Jacobs on the field at the same time. Secondary, two interceptions, 2 of 12 on third down, and 217 total yards with very few coming on the ground. Like Everybody else performed just how I want him to. But Ajani, Poncho, Gabriel, three guys, have to be better against Boise State. This question from Bobby. Hey, Spencer, long-time listener to the pod. Great content this offseason. Appreciate you. We all know today was a disappointment, and Boise State scored a bunch of points. The defense looks solid, but besides penalties, what is one easy thing we can fix on offense to compete with Boise State next week? It feels crazy to even have to say that, but at this point, I think we need to be concerned about next week. I'm recording the show late on Monday night. I wouldn't say my concern level against Boise State is exceptionally high it is higher than it was coming into the year no no doubt about that but as i mentioned on today's show there and and yesterday's show as well there's only the one thing really there are two there are two fix the offensive line which is kind of one category with two subcategories three win at the point of attack be better protecting dylan gabriel and cut down on the penalties okay so you have three things on the offensive line. If you do that, though, I suspect, given what I saw Dylan Gabriel do last year at Oklahoma, he's going to have more success pushing the ball down the field. When he does take those shots, he's got to be more accurate. He, he took one to Evan Stewart and was just a little bit off early in the game. Didn't really take one after that. But on that ball in particular, you got to give Evan Stewart a chance to catch it. You, you got to give him a chance to go up and get the ball, and he didn't. And that's the risk you run, of course, pushing the ball down the field. It's a lower percentage pass. But if there was one thing that I had to look at, it'd be the pass protection. Mm, No, pass protection second. I changed my mind. It'd be the run blocking. Because if 
Idaho, you know, I, I heard some chatter about, I think Gabriel was talking about how they, they were running a lot of uh, too high safety to take away the deep shots. Your answer to that has to be, we can just run the football down your throats and get six to seven yards of carry. If you do that, that opens up the deep passing game. That makes linebackers freeze on play action. That allows you to be more multiple and not only have a quick passing game, which we know Will Stein can scheme. We know Dylan Gabriel can execute, and we know those receivers are really good at it. So I'd say the run blocking is one thing. If you figure out how to run block and the pass protection is still iffy and the penalties are still there, I think the offense is dramatically better. But if you fix two of those things along the offensive line, pass pro, run block, penalties, you fix two of those, Oregon can roll against Boise State because their defense gave up almost 50 to Georgia Southern last week. Not great. Oregon's got a lot more talent than Georgia Southern. And Boise State's offense is a more potent threat than Georgia Southern's uh, or than, than Idaho's was on Saturday, to be sure. But if Oregon fixes what they have to correct, Boise State cannot play at Oregon's level. But that's an if, and that's why we play the games on the field. Love that question. Keep them coming as always. In fact, I've got a handful more to get to, but a couple of you raised a point that there were some players down dancing during shout on the sideline. Is this a bad sign? That's coming up next. First, let's talk about five-hour energy. Are you tired after lunch? You're not alone. In fact, research shows that more than 70% of us hit the wall after lunch. Let a five-hour energy shot help you leap over that wall instead of crashing into it. That's a much better place to go. With zero sugar and a convenient portable size, it's the perfect pick-me-up for getting stuff done. The 5-Hour Energy website has a bunch of flavors, too. They've got watermelon, tropical burst, grape, berry, and there's a flavor for everyone, I promise you, so go try them all. On the site, you even have the option to build your own 12-pack or a 24-pack. You choose the flavors, and it's delivered right to your door. It's that easy. If you go to 5hourenergy.com, that's the number 5, and then hourenergy.com, and get some 5-hour energy product today, you can use my promo code locked on CFB to get 20% off your order. This offer is only valid until September 30th on one order. Cannot be used with other promotions. The code is not good on subscription orders. Get the energy boost you need. Go to 5hourenergy.com today. All right, question came in from Chakuli8345. Serious mailbag question. Does it bother anyone else that our offensive line is dancing to shout after being bullied for three quarters and only being up seven to Idaho? To me, it shows how serious Oregon was taking this game. No, I am not majorly bothered by this. If you watch the television broadcast when they showcase shout, which is a phenomenal thing to do, you did not have starters on the sideline. Lanning, I think, has made that clear in the last couple of years. And I think he was asked about it when he kind of first got hired about, you know, what's your philosophy on, you know, letting guys shout and dance and all that stuff. And he said, look, we, we have a job to do first. We got, we got to win the game. And if we're in a position where we're confident we can do that, then, you know, maybe let him go a little bit more. But I did not see a video. Maybe I haven't seen it. I have not seen a singular video of a starting offensive lineman or any starter dancing to shout at the end of the third quarter from the Idaho game. If you've got it and I haven't seen it, by all means, let me know. But I saw guys that weren't on the field. So I understand your perspective of, man, why are they dancing? Why are they doing this? It's the guys that were not getting the playing time in that game. And they quickly realized, because it was closer than expected, that they were not going to get on the field. So do I have a problem with them dancing along to shout? and trying to raise the energy level on the sideline and get the crowd engaged? No, I have no problem with that whatsoever. I, I'd, quick, I'd much more quickly make the argument that if you are someone who's not going to see the field in the fourth quarter, I'd rather you do that because I don't want the energy on the sideline to be dead. I want there to be juice. I want there to be a buzz. I want there to be a pep in some guy's step. Whatever you can do to do that, raise the energy level, I'm here for it. So if starters were doing it, that'd be one thing. That's not what I saw. That is not what I understand. So uh, no, that did not bother me whatsoever. And it's one of the greatest traditions in college football. I always want it to be showcased any chance you can. Hopefully, it's a more excited shout and you can get a couple starters involved this Saturday against Boise State, but we know the Broncos are going to bring it. So this question came from Bud. 
who is a Locked on Ducks insider. So he can, you know, talk with me one-on-one, get priority access in the mailbag and all sorts of other perks. You can get a free 14-day trial if you click on that link in the description below. Ten players caught a pass on Saturday. Where was Jurion Dickey? Good question. I have one of two explanations. Number one, he got hurt in the spring game, and the reports were that he was healthy coming into the year. Maybe he's not entirely healthy. That is theory number one. He wasn't healthy last year, got hurt, got banged up in the spring game, wasn't super serious, but maybe got dinged up coming into the week. If, if that is the case, and I don't know, I do not have that source. I did not see a report uh, about an injury specifically for, for Jerry on Dickey there. Maybe he's not healthy. If he's not, big Justin Flo vibes, where he's got all the talent in the world to be an all-world player. Does he ever overcome the injury bug? Gosh, I hope he does, because he's a crazy, talented guy. Possible explanation number two. He got beat out for playing time by Kyler Casper. Kyler Casper was on the field a lot. He only had the one catch, which is a 21-yarder on, on third down. I think was Oregon's longest or second longest play on offense in, in the entire game. It was certainly one of them because they didn't have a lot of plays over 20 yards. They didn't have any over 30, which was definitely a concern. That's why I talked about the explosive plays earlier on today's show. But maybe Kyler Casper, who has an extra year of playing in the program, since he got here a season early in 2022, maybe he's just more ready. Maybe they just felt like it was a better matchup, or maybe they wanted to get Kyler Casper more, more run because they felt like that game was going to present an opportunity for guys that wouldn't normally play, maybe against Ohio State or Michigan, but should be able to get playing time against Idaho. I don't know, but I wasn't shocked not to see Jerry on Dickey on the field. I was excited for Kyler Casper to have that opportunity. It was a big catch. Uh, pretty sure it led to a touchdown later is at the very least a third down conversion. So where is Jerry on Dickey? I don't know. Continues to be a mystery uh, at, at some level. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure assuming he sticks around, which I think he will uh, for, for various reasons. He's someone that'll get talked about a lot in the off season on this show. I mean, I, I talked about him several times this off season. I'm sure it'll happen again next year because he's someone who his, his talent didn't go anywhere unless injuries have really set him back, which uh, I hope is not the case. Apollo asks, question for the show. Do you think the issues from Saturday's game are just a product of one, playing a vanilla game plan, causing the game to just be one, and Idaho played it well? Two, the players overlooked Idaho. Three, we seriously have issues. Four, Idaho was better than fans expected. Five, all the above. Five and a half, add in your own answer. I don't know that I buy the vanilla game plan. I... I what was different? We've seen Will Stein's offense before. What looked different from this game compared to last year? Like Idaho might just have a really good coaching staff. I think they do have a really good coaching staff. They've completely revitalized that program, which went to the FCS quarterfinals last year and has clearly reloaded with some talent after departures to the NFL draft and the transfer portal. So uh, I think Idaho was definitely better than, than fans expected, still shouldn't have been that close or anywhere near it. Uh, I think Idaho played a good game. I thought their defensive line looked big uh, when I was sitting up in the press box, and I didn't expect them to look as big compared to Oregon's offensive line. FCS teams usually look a little bit smaller. Those guys look pretty ready. They looked fast. They were playing hard. They were flying around. Could Oregon seriously have issues? Not ready to make that claim yet. They have problems, but serious issues? Haven't seen enough to indicate that's the case yet because, well, it's one game. And if you judged Oregon only on their Texas Tech game last year, they never would have made the Pac-12 championship game. But alas, they did. So uh, they can they can, they can they can certainly improve, and I'm optimistic that they will. The vanilla game plan discussion is something that, you know, was kind of flying around Oregon Twitter. Like, oh, I don't think they're showing all the plays. Like, I don't know, Tez Johnson had 12 catches for 81 yards and two touchdowns. They wanted to run the ball more. They tried a bunch of different concepts. They, you know, called passing plays and concepts that they, you know, called regularly in the 2023 season. Like, I don't think it was wildly vanilla. Like, if, if you were under the impression that it was just, oh, it was just a vanilla game plan, which definitely was felt like the case in 2021 against Fresno State before Oregon went and played Ohio State, 
I don't know what new wrinkles or play designs Will Stein's going to have. Maybe he will. Maybe he will. I don't get that sense at all. I think it was just an off day. Um, lastly here, this question from Just Us Willis. What is your ranking of top five quarterbacks in Oregon history? And more importantly, what would Dylan Gabriel have to do this year to jump into the top five in just one year as a duck? He'd have to lead Oregon at least probably to the national championship game. It's a high standard. Oregon's had a lot of great quarterbacks over the years. And look, if you go from almost losing to Idaho to playing for a national championship, yeah, Dylan Gabriel would be at the center of that, and he might fly up my list. But I've got Mariota 1, Bo Nix 2, Dennis Dixon 3, Herbert 4, Darren Thomas 5, just squeaking past Vernon Adams. And I, frankly, those guys might be a toss-up. I'm as big a Vernon Adams fan as anybody around. But I think for Dylan Gabriel this year, if you want to really – Make your mark with Oregon fans, at the very least, win the Big Ten, get to the college football playoff, have a legitimate chance to win a national championship. Because on paper, that's what this team can deliver. And if he does that as quarterback, then he'll win a lot of Oregon fans over. Thanks for making this your first listen. Go make Locked On College Football your second. I do indeed host over there, giving you the biggest stories in the greatest sport on planet Earth every single day, all year round. Five days a week and during the season, even more often than that just like this show. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.